COVID booster is a big problem for the government and for the country about the take up of uh, COVID boosters at the moment. To review those papers, Katie Balls and Laura Hughes. Welcome to you both. Laura, I was mentioning the Sunday Times story there. It's more a kind of collation and analysis of information rather than absolutely hard new facts, isn't it? Yeah, well, we knew that there was a pattern of the government handing out peerages to those who have given the governing party a lot of money. And obviously it's been the Tories for a number of years. And so we've seen a number of party treasurers finding themselves in, a, in the House of Lords. And the point this piece makes as well is that there is correlation between the amount of money that was given, but also a lot of these ex-treasurers don't seem to be making huge contributions. They don't speak much, to do the they? House no, of no. Lords. And that's the whole point. They're meant to be put in there because of their business, political experience, their nous, and clearly that might not be the case. There have been rumblings about who gets into the House of Lords forever. I mean, you know, Lloyd George after the First World War and Maundy Gregory and corruption and so forth. It's been a story that goes on and on and yet nothing ever seems to change. No, and well, when you have the governing party in a position to offer out perks like this to loyal donors, you can understand why they might not yeah. want to change the rules because they're getting lots of money and that's supporting their political objectives. So perhaps that's why it hasn't changed. But in the light of what ha has happened this week, this is sort of another example. Now, Laura, I said right at the beginning of the show the Tories noticed this kind of thing. Am I right or am I wrong? <laughs> well, it's mixed. So the, the, observer, the Observer have a poll that do show the PM's ratings at an all-time low. Um, but overall, the Conservatives are still polling as the most popular party, despite all this. everything that's happened. But, you know, I do, you know, just from talking to people, I think the last week has actually cut through. And it was a really techy, complicated story at the beginning, and then it became really simple. It became about Tory sleaze and the party in power changing the rules at the last minute to save one of their own. And that did make a difference. But... Who knows that the, yeah. the polls don't suggest it's made a, a massive difference. Katie, if it cuts through, if it causes problems for the Prime Minister long term, it's probably partly about how Tory MPs themselves regard all of this. Is there any evidence that they are as angry as some of the papers have been reporting in the last couple of days? Yeah, I think there is evidence. Um, I think it's been an awful week for the Prime Minister, and uh, I think where we're going to see it most immediately is in terms of the mood in the parliamentary party. You have Tory MPs quite spooked by the mail they've been getting um, going into their inboxes. They say it's not quite Barnard Castle levels of anger, but it's pretty close this compared is to emails the emails, not the Daily Mail. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, <With that too. laughs> yeah, all coming through. And then, um, and then I think that what we're hearing and what you can see uh, in some of the papers, such as this item in Anna McClover's diary. Uh, diary in the mail on Sunday is how difficult is party management going to get? Um, she uh, quotes a, a message from Philip Davies, um, who I think has always Sorry, been seen MP, as quite, quite on the right quite, of the party yeah, and quite independent minded. But he um, makes the point, you know, that he voted with the government, wasn't particularly happy about doing so, um, but then. It, the party overturned that decision and said it made him look like a fool, so good luck with any free line whips in the future. He's simply saying, I'm not going to do what you yeah. tell me in the future. That's quite a moment. It, exactly, mm. and even though I think uh, Philip Davies is seen as more independent-minded, it's something I'm picking up from MPs too, in the sense that the few Tory MPs who have come out with, well, probably as a stretch, but, you know, <laughs> OK this week, are those who ultimately rebelled, ignored the government. In the case, for example, of Angela Richardson, lost her job as a PPS, then was reinstated, is not really sending a message even to those on the payroll that you should be listening to what the government is saying if they can't even mm. guarantee it's, they're going to go forward with that. Um, and Laura, there seems to be an interesting division between, in attitude between, as it were, the old-time so-called Spartans, the Brexiteer uh, MPs who in many ways thought that they were in control of the parliamentary party, and those new Conservative MPs from the so-called Red Wall seats in the North and the Midlands who've come in and have a slightly different view. Yeah. The Mail's got an interesting piece on that. Exactly, and, and the, the Spartans who very much were at the forefront of the Brexit movement actually claimed huge amount of success on that front and were seen as sort of the old guard. You could, they rallied round Owen Paterson, didn't you they? You could physically see them rally round their friend Owen Paterson in the House of Commons, and I think the Prime Minister does listen to them because they were right on, on Brexit. They did have a success there in terms of, you know, what the public wanted. But this has massively backfired. You've got a much younger intake who have come from these seats that used to be Labour, who are seeing how this is playing out on the front pages and, like Katie said, are going back to the whips and, and potentially they might refuse the government 
older and in the future, they're going to have to they're going to have to go with their own gut instinct because their voters are watching them. So, Katie, where does the cabinet sit in all of this? Because you would have thought the cabinet would be the kind of fail-safe mechanism that would stop the government getting into these kind of troubles in the first place. I think the absence, um, you know, looking at the papers when it comes to where, where are the cabinet, um, you have a few anonymous, angry briefings. Um, but I think it just points to the fact that. Part of the reason this has caused such a stink this week for Boris Johnson is it is touching on previous worries um, that ultimately Number 10 do not consult really anyone outside Number 10. Some people in Number 10 perhaps aren't even consulted. And, um, and the Cabinet just aren't brought in on big decisions. And I think the fact that um, Jacob rees Mark Spencer, the Chief Whip, are the two who seem to be leading this uh, you know, doomed plot to um, spare Owen Patterson suspension, um, the fact that you don't really have the other players in Cabinet really even in that conversation mm. putting a call into the Prime Minister and saying, you know, change minute. course, yeah. um, this is a mistake, I think does just show you that slowly but surely they're being cut more and more out of decisions. Mm. And it's been a cause of unease for some time, but things like and, this really, you know, light it up again. And John Major said there was an element of bullying. Now, we know that John Major doesn't like this government, that's no news, but uh, you had an extraordinary line in your story, Laura, about Tory MP who was told, either by the Whips or by the Prime Minister, that if he didn't fall into line on this very, very controversial vote, his constituency might lose money. Well, yes, and, and we spoke to a number of MPs who are currently asking the government for lots of money for projects in their constituencies, and it was very much implied to them that you want to stay on the government's good side. And I think a lot of MPs took the decision, well, this is going to go through anyway, it'll create a bit of a stink, I might as well get some money out of it. And, and a lot of them felt I need to stay on the government's that's, good side, and I've got to pick threat, my battles. That's quite a threat. Let's move on to another big story for the whole country at the moment, Katie, which is COVID still. People are very confused about where we exactly are. Uh, there seems to be a general feeling that the, the booster uh, vaccine programme is not going nearly as well as the first part of the vaccine programme. The rollout was lauded around the world and certainly here in Britain. This time round, it's different. Mm. Yes, and the Telegraph have an interesting story, which is, you know, boosters need an injection of urgency after deaths of double jabbed over 70s. And the piece is pointing to statistics for, from the government's own reports, but also mm. the fact that if you compare our booster program to places like Israel, could these lives have actually, you know, been saved? Are they needless deaths because we have been slower this time around? And I think when you look at that booster program, there's lots of questions about why is it different than the original vaccine rollout? What's going wrong? Is it because we're, you know, back then, uh, you know, there's a real national effort, um, people are just, you know, a bit switched off, or is it the fact that we've had some big, uh, you know, personnel changes, you've had people moving around, mm. we have a new vaccines minister, you've had the number 10, um, you had the person who was in charge of uh, the vaccines on, on the civil service side move to number 10 to focus on domestic policy, only to then be brought back um, in a sign that they really were quite worried that this is falling behind. So organisational mess-ups. Yeah. Um, and potentially people feel as though life is a bit more normal so there isn't that urgency no whereas before, fear factor. exactly yeah. whereas i think before people thought right life can return to normal if if i get double vaccinated and that's slightly gone because people are out and about as normal and there's an interesting story isn't there about people in care homes who have chosen not to be vaccinated now moving into the nhs yeah and, and one in ten which i was quite surprised about and the rules change on thursday so you'll have lots of workers still refusing to get vaccinated and the fear is that they'll just move into the hospitals and that they'll stay within the NHS and they'll just go where they're allowed to. And of course, that's completely counterintuitive because the whole point about vaccinating care home staff is that you protect the elderly. So sending them into places where people are vulnerable and ill, it, it seems a bit of a mismatch there and it could be a huge problem. Okay. So we have talked about the two most important stories this morning. We haven't had time to get to the 1,300, 476 other interesting stories in today's newspaper. Always, we say, buy your newspapers, and so to the weather. I am one of those who no longer gets excited by fireworks, but I have been excited by some of the most glorious, bright November days in many, many years. At its best, this can be the most beautiful season of the year. More clear skies, please. Over to Matt Taylor in the weather studio. Matt, doesn't look very clear.